Today I am joined by the lovely Rachel Singleton and Rachel is someone that I had not, my path had not crossed at all until about three months ago I think and I heard her on a podcast with Liz Scott and I remember just kind of stopping what I was doing and just being drawn into the conversation and drawn into listening to this amazing voice that was coming out of my phone that I just was transfixed by the hope within the story that she shared and subsequent to that I joined a course that Rachel's running with Ian Watson um, around holistic health which has broadened and widened my kind of seeing of health even further than than it had been before and so this the idea behind hopeful conversations was to to bring people in to to explore health from a different angle from from a traditional approach i guess to to bring people in who could speak about their journeys that were more hopeful i guess than the than the fixed or rigid way that we have been accustomed to seeing ill health or poor health or whatever so yeah i'm delighted I, i'm going to hand over to rachel to tell her story of um you know of it would just be fascinating i think for people to know a little bit about your kind of journey you know where, what your sort of diagnosis was um and, and where you kind of are with it now i guess thank you and thank you for that lovely introduction vicky um yeah i guess it all started when i was in my late teens and i started to get quite severe abdominal pain and digestive disturbances and at some point around there i was told i had ibs um and despite trying lots of things that that just worsened you know I just um it should be a fairly simple now I know it's actually fairly simple to to rebalance your gut and to change that but at that point it just didn't seem as if I had that information um and it it got a lot worse it was there on a daily basis to the point where I was really in severe chronic pain so I would wake in the morning and um within moments I was um, I had this intense spasmodic pain that kind of started in my abdomen and took over my whole body and it was just excruciating. I had that every morning and then throughout the day there was kind of variations on that theme um, and it was it just got to be so much a part of everything that I that I almost didn't realize I had an illness. Do you know what I mean? It was like I just I just learned to function with it being there. Um, but all the time I was still seeking, you know, I was really wanting answers. Mm. However, I realized that I, I never really told the people around me. There's a lot of people who knew me through those years who didn't know that I had that going on. Mm. And it just never really dawned on me to make that much of a fuss about it. So it, it stayed quite hidden, I guess, in a way. Um, but it was a source of real distress for me. And there was times when I just felt profound despair and I couldn't physically thrive there was a lot of things I couldn't do that other people could I'm surrounded by people who are incredibly athletic and adventurous and they scale mountains and go 100 mile bike rides and <laughs> do impossible things like this <laughs> I do something like that and I and I would be out of it for like the next month whilst my body recovered and so there was a part of me that just felt this wasn't fair, you know, that I could see people just chuck food into their body and do whatever they wanted um, and thrive in a way that I couldn't. And, you know, I mean, I did all sorts of things like really, really lots of restriction diets, trying to find out what is this one thing that's causing this problem. Yeah, yeah. And I worked with lots of alternative systems of medicine, some of them would give me respite for a while, some palliated, some gave me no help and kind of sent me down rabbit holes. But, at, but all the way through, I guess I was, I was learning things, you know, I was learning things about holistic medicine, I was learning things about my body. I look back now, and I can see that whole journey was 
invaluable in many ways. And, and also there's something about learning to live with chronic pain that, that gives you a real insight into other people who have that going on. You know, it, it just, you can really understand that from the inside. I think the, the turning point came for me when, I mean, for years, for years and years and years, I'd been journaling. So every morning I would journal and, and I always had this ability to access a really kind, loving part of myself. So I would often do it as a kind of conversation. So the part of me that felt most in need, most struggling with whatever it might be that day, I would write from there. And then I would kind of get that out of my system and then tune into something else let something else come through and I variously called that God or spirit or um, whatever it might be at that time that I was exploring but it was always this sense of um, a wiser part of me a higher part of me if you like and the voice that came was always loving and I actually got very practical advice there and when I looked back I got to a point where I looked back over a load of my journals I never reread them and I realized that I'd been given the same messages for years by this very loving part of me. And I'd never really implemented that. Wow. Some of it I had, but other bits I hadn't, you know, and I was just getting a very simple advice, like, you know, just ease back, stop putting pressure on yourself, listen in more, stop um, kind of jettisoning yourself in the moment so that it always felt like I put myself aside to be with whatever was coming up that needed dealing with. And then I'd kind of pick myself back up afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what I'd find is that the self that I picked up afterwards would be maybe exhausted or cold or hungry or, and I just hadn't noticed that because I'd got so embroiled in what was going on out there or what someone else needed. So this, there was this deep not listening <laughs> going on yeah. in the moment and also to this wisdom that was coming through. And when I started to go back and look at that, I found this treasure trove of, um guidance and and it shone you know it had this simplicity to it and this beauty to it and so I I thought well I've got nothing to lose I could listen to that part of myself you know I could stop going out there and looking for other people's answers and I could just come in here and and that journey's been going on for the last three years and within a couple of weeks the pain went and and I came across things like I came across a lovely program called the Paddison program which is actually for people who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis but it's the central to his program is um, a very simple way of eating to heal your gut and so I embarked on that and learned how to do that and that gave me massive boost and really started to reduce the inflammation in my body. I started to walk around without any pain. I started to have more energy. And, and all the way, it was this sense of that if I just listen in, in the moment, this body of mine is beautifully responsive. It will tell me what I need. It will tell me when I'm uncomfortable. It will tell me when I'm cold. It will tell me when I'm hungry. It will tell me when what I'm about to eat is making my energy shrink back because it doesn't suit me in that moment to have that. It will tell me when I'm full because the food stop taste, stops tasting as nice. The same food that I was eating three bites ago that was lovely, suddenly I don't need it anymore. And so it was like locking in to this inner superpower, you know, that's, wow. that's just about listening to and trusting my body and I had been forcing it and pushing it and pressurizing it and neglecting it for years and I hadn't realized and what my body was doing was saying this hurts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this makes me tense this feels really uncomfortable I'm trying to show you I don't like this and now that seems so simple but back then I couldn't see it Yeah, it's like I'm really intrigued by your the whole the whole idea of journaling and how you know you know what at what age were you were you doing that because clearly you had that connection 
you know, from from long before you actually started to look at it and listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's always been there. I remember as a child, um, my mum used to teach creative writing classes in an evening. And um, so I think it was two or three evenings a week and I would and I would miss her when she was gone. So this was when I was maybe, I don't know, five, six years old, I think. And so I would write her a poem. I would pretend I was at the class. And I would write her a poem so that when she came back, there was something there for her. And she started taking them to the class <laughs> because we, it was like the sense of, I, don't, I didn't know where they were coming from. You know, they were coming from somewhere else inside. And I remember having a dream when I was younger. Um, and I, I dreamt, well, I could see in the stream, I could see this young girl and she didn't look like me. She had kind of long blonde hair. She was small. She almost looked a bit like Alice in Wonderland. I could just see the back of her. And um, she went up to a tree and she, she just put her hand to the tree and, and she started to move it over the bark of the tree. And it was like, she could read it. So to her, it was like Braille, you know, it was like a language she could read. And, and she was just listening to the story of the tree. And then I woke from the dream and realized it was only a dream. And I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I felt like my heart was breaking. I felt like that there was something in there that just felt so native and true and beautiful. And then I woke up and I didn't know how to do that. And then about 10 years later, I learned um, about something called flower essences. Um, and people might know about flower remedies and rescue remedy and things like that. They're, they're famous worldwide. Um, and these are natural remedies for, for really touching our consciousness, for lifting our consciousness. And they help with emotional and mental states. And we were introduced to those whilst I was on the homeopathic training. And I, and I had this really deep sense of coming home. And that night, that dream came back to me that I'd had when I was younger. Oh, oh goosebumps. Oh, Wow. <laughs> And I kind of felt like I'm going to do this. I, I, I know how to do this. And, and so I set about making essences as per Dr. Bach's instructions. And, and they really didn't do anything. <laughs> they just didn't work. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. I thought I'd found my life's path. And, and here I am at a time in my life when I was crippled with pain. And this was going to be the thing that was going to sort all that out. And so I kind of had to go back to the drawing board and, I, and I, I sort of set all that down for a while. And then a few months later, um, my beloved grandmother died and she had a very painful last few weeks of her life. And, and, I, and I was going for a walk about two weeks after the funeral um, and it was a gorgeous day and it was in June and all the flowers were out. Um, and I kind of, was thinking gosh this would be the perfect day to make an essence but I wasn't in the space for that and I was just kind of walking along and I felt very um lost in darkness you know very unsure of who I was and where I was going and why my body was in so much pain and just so many questions and not enjoying life at all um and and then I came upon this tiny little white flower which I since learned is a lesser stitch what and it looks like a little immaculate little white star and there was loads of them kind of growing in amongst all the other plants like a constellation of stars and and when I saw it the words that came to me were angel star it just seemed like this something from the heavens and and it completely stopped me in my tracks I felt like this was um the opposite to how I felt you know I felt muddy and dark and bogged down and this was clean and defined and bright and startling and pure and and I and I just kind of grabbed some of the plant there was loads of it so I knew it was abundant I just grabbed some of it and kind of held it to me and and felt everything quiet and settle and all of that darkness just seemed to slip away within moments and I I could hear all these words and phrases about what this plant was for as a medicine as a flower essence and it was like a download of information coming through and there were 
complex, fully formed uh, sentences. You know, it wasn't just little bits and pieces. It was like a load of information. And I kind of managed to get myself back home, walking just slower and slower and getting more and more blissed out. <laughs> and then I got home and I, and I made an essence from that. And that was the start of me then for 20 years working with flowers and plant medicine. And, and, and that day, that dream that I'd had as a child kind of came into being, you know, there was something in what was happening there that I could then look at any flower and immediately see what it was for. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, over those, there was a, a very concentrated period of 15 to 20 years of working with those. All the time, the information I was getting there was deeply pertinent to my own well-being. And it's like I took it in about 10%. You know, I, I, I was giving that information out. I was sharing that with others. But on a personal level, I took it in about 10%. And then bit by bit by bit, those gentle essences just kept working on me. <laughs> and the plants kept working on me. And, and that whole dialogue of learning to be in my body and be listening in and be feeling for my own answers and trusting the wisdom that comes through and trusting our connection with the natural world all of that started to come together and and I think just the, the gentleness and the consistency of it you know when I look back through all those essence descriptions and look back through all those journals the message has been constantly loving constantly about care self-care self-kindness and this this thing about being responsive in the moment about knowing that right now we're in a dialogue with our body that's in a dialogue with the world that's giving us this impeccable feedback and how much of our time do we spend disregarding that or suppressing that or pushing that to one side or being far too busy to to think of ourselves and and it's like we've kind of learned this culture of of not listening in yeah we've learned that we have to go outside to find the answers that we have to get someone in a white coat or someone with a degree in this or someone with a qualification that to tell us what to do with our own bodies it's nonsense yes the specialist can help us but the true specialist is us. Nobody can read our own body like we can read it. And it's a language we were born with. And it's a language we can get back. And I guess for me, I feel really passionate about helping people to remember how to listen to their bodies. Yeah, yeah I guess there's two things that came up there for me. First was just hearing you talk about your work with the flowers and how you know you were sort of taking 10% of that message in for yourself hearing 10% of that it's like there's something that really rings true in that for me it's like we can listen to others whether it be a plant or a person or whatever but to turn that on ourselves and to, to use that same ability to listen to ourselves is kind of alien like for me i'm really comfortable listening and holding people giving people space meeting them where they're at but the idea that that had never occurred to me to do that for me mm. and it's only in the last sort of month or so that that's kind of i've kind of realized that i can offer that to me as well <laughs> like i don't have it doesn't have to be to others but we're almost conditioned to to, to I don't know like to be thinking of others and not ourselves like it's a bad thing to think of ourselves so we shouldn't do that we should always consider other people first mm. yeah there's that real kind of cultural thing isn't there about yeah putting other people before us and and growing up in a in a society where there is a medical profession that that tells us what is wrong with our body and what that body then needs and what we do with that. You know, there's these two ways in which, two really fundamental ways in which we've, we've learned not to listen. 
and you know, I mean, I see this time and time again when I'm I, I mentor a lot of um, health practitioners, and the biggest area that I work in with people is that of recovering their own self care. Mm. You know, because it seems to me we can't really effectively help someone if we're not able to help ourselves, yeah. and that and that there's something so deeply nourishing about being in constant communion with yourself mm. about not having to push yourself to one side but actually having yourself be here present mm. in the moment in the conversation in whatever's going on because if we are here fully then anything we're doing gets imbued with that presence and anyone we're interaction interacting with is in that deep connection with us, there's a richness to that. But we're also in the process of, of being regenerated by that very connection, by that very sense of presence. It's like it renews us moment by moment. And it soothes the body, it feels good to the body. The body just goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> and that's feedback that's the kind of feedback we want yeah. and you know while, while I was hearing you then I could all I could hear was a particular friend of mine who would say but but there's so much going on there's so I've got to look after all these people they all need my support they all need my I don't have time for me how am I supposed to stop and listen in to me like that's just not on the agenda I, I can't do that you know mm -hmm. I have got family who are 100% dependent on me with their additional needs with this with that so I just would love to know how you you know how how you know for someone who's like that, that that is in that place of just constantly caring for others and that never finds the time to 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 do anything for themselves or to listen in or to or to you know follow any of their own kind of inner guidance what what would you say to somebody in that sort of space I mean, there's so much in that, you know, there's so much that strikes me about that because in a way it's a narrative that they've got going, you know, that, that this is how it has to be for them. And the first thing I would want to question is, is that true? And is that helpful for you? And, you know, there's something about when we assume that other people are reliant on us, that takes away from their journey. Mm. You know, I think many of us, when we first started out as health practitioners of some form or another, we wanted to help everybody. And, you know, I know I certainly went in there wanting to do everything for them to make them better. Mm. And it took me, okay. yeah. yeah, it took me a lot of years before I really recognized that they were being given something truly valuable in the very experience or challenge or illness they were going through. And who was I to take that away or even think that I could? Because their, their own journey was their own evolutionary growth. That was their path. That was what life was giving them. That was what they were at some level agreeing with and bringing into being in order to uncover strength and resilience and resources and consciousness in themselves that they didn't know they had so you know it can be really helpful to people who do feel very responsible for a lot of people to just be reminded that some of that is not their business <laughs> as Byron Katie would put it you know it's not their business and it's not in their remit it's not for them to fix that and what they can do instead which is a much more again we come back to this kind of this idea of how presence is nourishing it they can just be with yeah. that person when they're struggling yeah. they can sit with them they can love them and hear them without trying to solve any of that mm. and just really hear them so that can that can lighten so much of that anyway and and then another key piece to this is that we actually really don't care for anybody very well if we're not caring for ourselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, we've all been there when we get ratty and frayed at the edges and just too tired to respond properly. We're reactive, you know, we're irritable and we can kind of see our loved ones like flinching, <laughs> tiptoeing around us. And can I be, can I ask them, can I come near this person at the moment? Yeah. Or are they going to bite my head off? You know, we, we think we're being this person who's doing all these things for everyone, but actually how much fun are we to be around? How loving are we being? how how much harmony are we radiating into our home or into our relationships and the chances are you know I know when I'm in that I've got to do everything mode I'm not radiating harmony no. <laughs> by no. any stretch of the imagination <laughs> <laughs> and actually just to go away counterintuitive as it is when there's things piling up all over the place but to just go away and come back to yourself go and do something that's for you and put that into place so that you actually feel lighter and happier and less burdened and you come back into that situation and you'll see it differently you'll know what to pick up you'll know what to let go you'll know how to ask for help you'll know what can be done three days time rather than right now and your sense of perspective comes back so I guess all of these are ways in which you can kind of loosen the tightness of that narrative of I have got to do everything and I haven't got time for me because that is a it's a narrative of self-neglect and of even of martyrdom you know there's a sense in which everything's up to me yeah. well no no it isn't yeah yeah I love that when I was having a conversation with a lady this morning and it what really kind of helped and resonated her was to say you know, in that moment when we're so caught up in that, I've got to do this and that's got to happen and I, it's all on me, is to do exactly that in that you turn in and just say, what do I need or want now? In this moment now, not, not what I needed or wanted yesterday or an hour ago or, you know, what I should need or want because that's self-care, whatever that means. But the whole idea that moment by moment we can ask ourselves that question and it immediately brings you back to the present moment to to now not to the stories of what needs to happen or what should be happening or and it was it was just a beautiful conversation just mm -hmm. and I find it so helpful to do that for me when I'm getting you know caught up in all the busyness and all that especially this time of year when you can kind of get waylaid by the oh I must do this and I must do that I've got to sort this and it's like well, hang on a minute that doesn't feel very nice what do I yeah. actually want or need right now in this moment and it's immediate back to what is yeah it's like it just interrupts yeah. that that track that you're on that tram line it's like oh actually a I'm on a tram line and b do I want to be on it yeah it's a lovely question yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's so much there's so much that we don't yet know about the kind of juiciness of this self-reflective quality, this kindness to ourselves. You know, I think at the heart of it, it always feels kind to me, mm -hmm. and that when we when we can allow ourselves to be kinder, when we can start to see where we're not being as well you know, start to, like you were saying, it just doesn't feel very nice in the body. When we can start to recognize that that's happening and then just see what we're doing to take us there and see whether we need to keep doing that or whether we can actually just put that down. And what, what would happen then? Is the world going to end? Is everything going to fall apart? <laughs> can I actually put down all of that stress around this and just be here in a fresh new way in this moment and see what see what this has to offer because I haven't lived this moment. I've never lived this version of whatever's going on in my head. So how about if I'm just here with the moment and I am responsive to what feels good to me, what I need, what I want right now. And I follow that wisdom like this little breadcrumb trail that's just taking me deeper into a flow and well-being 
and ease. Mm. And, and as that kind of loosens up inside, then there's so much energy that has been expended on trying and pushing and pressure and striving that suddenly becomes available. It becomes available to the body. It becomes available to the consciousness. And, and a flood of energy starts to come through us. You know, I remember the first time when I really felt well and just how how strong and vibrant the quality of that was and, how, and what it feels like to wake up in the morning and not wake into pain. Mm. You know, even now there's some mornings when I wake and I'm expecting it because I had so many years of it. And then there's like this, oh my God, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just not necessary anymore. My body stopped having to give me that message now and it can just be peaceful. And then all the energy that it took to manage pain and be in pain and cope with pain and wow that's just not that's not doing that anymore yeah it's available yeah to be used in other ways yeah and it just spills out you know it just wants to radiate it wants to touch everything and so your life starts to take on this whole other quality so the, the potential for this is so transformative. And it, you make it sound so simple. They kind of, you know, just listen. You've got your own wisdom. Your body knows. Your body's telling you. It's going to give you the guidance piece by piece to follow. But for somebody who's in that seeking mode, in that where I was for many, many years of, you know, try this diet, try that diet, you know, read this book, whatever, to try to find something to fix me because there was something wrong that I didn't like. For somebody who's there, how, you know, how, how, how do they get this? How do you navigate it? Yeah. How do they get this guidance? Like, I, you know, I'm sure there's people shouting like, I want that, but it doesn't happen. Where is it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it is there. It's the thing that's prompting you in a way to look at things. So the seeking itself isn't a problem. But the thing to notice is how you feel in the seeking. So if you're and one day you're kind of looking for things and you just feel more and more tense and you're stressed and you're just trying to find an answer and it's like there's this whole agitation and compulsion about it, then you're not in your well-being. And when you're not in your well-being, usually what you draw to you from that place, from that fearful, agitated place is more fear and more agitation. So you can see that escalating tension or a sense of being driven or a sense of compulsion or like, I've got to fix this, that fearfulness as an indication that those are untrustworthy thoughts. Mm -hmm. And if on another day you're in a much calmer space and you happen upon something or you just get this thing, oh, I must just look at that. Somebody told me about such and such. I'm just going to have a look at that. And then you just find yourself reading that or watching something on the internet and and something about that just feels good. Mm. And you can feel like a knot inside you releasing as you, as you read that or as you look at that. It's like there's a recognition. Oh, God, yeah, I feel better for that. That would be lovely. Mm. Then that is what I call good medicine. Mm. That's something that resonates for you. It feels true for you. Mm. It feels like it balances you. And for as long as it feels like that, then that's something that you might want to invite into your life in some way. And then if at some point it stops feeling like that, then recognize that you've used up that, you know, you're moving on to a different medicine now. And the world will give you many different medicines at once. That's so key, I think. And that's something that I had totally missed. So I would find something and I would, it would feel exciting and you know oh this you know this this feels right this is what I want to do and I would do it 
and then it would stop feeling like that and it would it would feel like like with the restricted diets at the beginning it was all manageable it was there was kind of hope there there was whatever and then it became like a chore or a um I just felt sad that I couldn't have certain things uh, or you know I would be constantly thinking about what I could and couldn't eat and checking things and if we were going out having to pack my own food and just this the amount of stressful thinking that went on with that and me just not recognizing at all that it, there, it was time to open up and see what else there might be that this had kind of run its course and it was time to move on but I think the fear keeps you trapped there it's like well I kind of feel better so and I then eat these things that I've taken out because if I do that then I'm gonna feel bad again and all of that busy thinking just contributing to the feeling bad mm -hmm. but to to, yeah. not to recognize that I think is so key yeah um, you start to feel that tightness about something that it doesn't feel fun anymore it feels res too restrictive too difficult mm -hmm. And sometimes we we need to let go of something we're doing. Other times we'll maybe just happen upon someone talking about the very same thing that we're doing, but in a way that feels really wholesome. Yeah. You know, so I had the experience after I'd been eating in the way that I learned from the Patterson program, which was very restricted at first. And then you gradually introduce more things. And I kind of got stuck at one point where it was still quite restrictive and I couldn't seem to introduce anything else. And I started to kind of yeah, feel myself like, oh, I, I'm not, I don't want this. I don't want to be like this forever. It doesn't feel healthy to just not be able to eat certain things. And how much of this is psychological and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I was really kind of churning around with that. And then I happened to hear somebody talking about how she'd really learned to eat with simplicity, that she'd come to realize that just because there's this smorgasbord of food out here in the world now from every possible culture and ethnicity and part of the world and with goodness knows how many processes and chemicals from in some of those foods, you know, and she said there's just like this massive choice and what I thought was that I should be able to handle all that yeah and what I realized that my body was telling me time after time was that it just wanted really simple beautiful wholesome food mm -hmm. and and when I heard her say that I was just like that's it that's true for me and this isn't this isn't restriction this is sanity <laughs> in an insane world yeah. you know that there's something about this that I can really honor because it is really honoring me it's really helping my body and, and it just shifted me out of that resistance and I was back on track with it again but that but that came from that acknowledging there was something not quite right here but being willing to not know what the answer was yeah and I think that there's something really potent about sitting in the unknown you know, just recognizing and acknowledging our own struggle at times and just saying, you know, I do not know what to do with this yeah. and I am struggling. And, and, and if we kind of throw it open to the universe like that, it's like we open our own minds and something else can come in and we'll hear something or we'll read something or we'll just get this sense of it in a different way. We'll see it in a different way and, and we're on our way again. I, does that make sense yeah I absolutely love that it's like the temptation is to always find a reason to 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 pin something down to to you know I mean I do it I still do it and I catch myself doing it but you know oh my ex has suddenly flared up so oh what's that about oh it must be because I've done this or I've eaten this or I've you know my, immediately my mind goes there but I mm. now I'm like I'm what I'm kind of tuned into that I can see what's happening and I know there's no but that's just made up like I'd go how could I know like all I know is that my body's telling me something that's it that's 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 it and as you say when we can just sit in that I don't know why I've got the expert back on my hands but 
being quiet allows me to potentially hear something whether it's put some moisturizer on or wear your gloves or you know like a, a, any number of things could come through into my mind mm -hmm. whereas if I'm scrabbling around trying to find oh it was this or it must be that or maybe I'll write this down or I'm I'm I'm, I'm not open yeah I don't anything different I'm back in the old narrative yeah in the habitual thinking yeah yeah that's what I really feel as well like I go into the kind of analyzing pushing trying to get an answer and it's and again it's that agitation inside that compulsion to kind of sort this out and yes. make this go away yes, <laughs> like, I want to do something about this yes whilst actually okay my body isn't great in some way or other at the moment so the first thing I know to do then is to back off and rest and let my mind settle and do lovely things and just see see how much that eases everything anyway. De-inflame myself, you know, in some way. Yeah. And yeah. then if there's anything else, it'll come through. Yeah. I mean, this is so, so powerful. It's just crazy. Like, I think for, you know, for so many years, I had focused purely on the physical. I'd focused on you know, all the physical things that I could do for my body. And I was kind to it. You know, I ate well, I exercised, I meditated. I, you know, I did all the things you're supposed to do. But there was a missing piece to the puzzle that was just not clear to me. And then suddenly it became clear at the, I guess, at the right time for me, which was the power of our mind. Mm -hmm. that, our, that our mind and our body are 100% connected, that our body is just responding to our mind. It's just a reflection of our mind. <sighs> Whoa, mm -hmm. that for me was just, and still is, an, an unfolding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And one of the things that really was really challenging and lovely for me to see was because I'd been so used to eating like you know like you're saying eating in careful ways doing making sure that even on really tired days I still exercised I was still kind of moving my body I was regardless of the time of year or the weather or anything these last three years every winter I've I've just needed to back off from all of that I've needed to listen into a very different way of eating where I'm eating much more um, like I so I quite often have lots of raw stuff I don't can't do that in the winter it's like my body just doesn't want it I want really lovely nourishing warming stodgy <laughs> carbohydrate rich foods that just feel really settling and um and just calm my body and make it feel full and, and lovely and well fed and I don't want to be exercising so much I don't want to be throwing my body around um so you know this part of me then starts to think oh my god well I'm going to get really unfit I'm going to lose all that muscle tone I'm going to you know it's like it's, there's just there's just all these stories yeah. about what will happen if I don't do that and then there's this knowing in the body that's just saying just don't do that <laughs> trust me yeah. don't do that just chill out, just relax, just be warm, be comfortable. When you've got loads of energy, you will go out and do something. Yeah. And that will just naturally happen. But don't try and make it happen. Don't push it. Don't force it. Live within the seasons of the body. Live within the balance of that. And within the conversation, don't try and impose something on it. And that, you know, that's still something I'm learning. You know, I feel like a complete beginner with that. And it and it makes me feel very humble when I kind of um do something that is harmful to my body, you know, I push it in some way or I um and I can feel it struggling. I think, oh, I, I don't want to keep doing that. I did that for so many years. How would it be to live in kindness with my body. Yeah, it's such a different way to approach health from what we're used to. We're so out of touch of listening to that. We dismiss it it's like, oh, you know, you need to go to bed early. Like, might be the the, the sort of 
feeling that I'm really tired, I just need to go to bed. But then there's that that's just pushed to one side because there's dishes that need washing and there's clothes that need hanging up and there's and we're so used to overriding. Override, override, press the override button. And then I think we get so far in life and the override button can't be pressed anymore. It's like, no, no, the body is just gonna complain and complain and complain until it you have to stop. Exactly. Find yeah. a way of stopping you overriding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely way of putting it. You don't want to get there. No. Why get there? Why get to that point if you can if you don't have to? Yeah. Yeah. And another piece to that is how the body can be quite unorthodox at times. Like one of the things that I was experiencing over the last couple of months was um I've been kind of flooded with loads of new insights, partly because of the training that Ian and I are teaching that you're on. And, you know, it's just stimulating so much thought around health and around this whole idea of wholeness and the holistic paradigm. And, and so when I get lots of that coming through, then I know I'm going to start writing again because I, I, I love writing. So I, so I've been, collating some of that and some other things that have been coming through and so then what started to happen was I was um waking in the night sometimes at two o'clock sometimes at five o'clock and wide awake wide awake and loads of ideas coming through and I'm thinking well no this isn't the right time to be awake <laughs> and I've got whatever needs to happen during the day I really need to be asleep so I'm lying there needing to be asleep and not being asleep yeah, yeah. And, and there's this whole kind of fight going on when my consciousness is going saying bing I'm here I'm ready we've got stuff to do and and I was talking to um, a lovely lady who she and I were on the same training a couple of years ago and she was saying that she's um, she's gone to live in a different place and she's got a very very gentle quiet life at the moment um, and she finds that she's tired and ready to sleep by about half eight or nine in the evening and then she's waking at four or five o'clock and so that's become like her night time mm -hmm. and when she wakes at four or five o'clock that's when she wants to be awake and then she'll potter out and see the beautiful sunrise because she lives near the coast and then she'll do what she's doing during the day and then later on she'll go and see the beautiful sunset and she's just got herself in time with this different rhythm there's this rhythm going on inside her body there's a rhythm going on inside nature and she's just really in it and hearing her saying that I was like oh my god you mean it's okay to be up at five o'clock it's okay to wake at this time and and so I just started to really relax around that process and then discovered that I can, if I do that, and if I have a night like that, then if at some point in the day I can take half an hour and just have a cat nap, then that's lovely. And then that keeps me going for the rest of the day. And then, you know, and it just works and it works really well. And, and meanwhile, what I'm writing at those times is totally different. The energy of it is totally different from what I would write in the daytime. It's got nighttime energy to it. It's got a richness to it. and and I'm accessing something that I wouldn't otherwise access. So, you know, I love this sense that I would impose on my body what yeah. I think it should do. Yeah. And you know that you're meant to have seven or eight hours of sleep and it's meant to be unbroken. And it's meant, to, well, no, my body's doing like four or five really good hours. Then it's having two hours off and then it's having another couple of hours and then it has an hour later. Yeah. And that's how it's doing it at the moment. And, and actually on that, if I'm just gentle with myself, then then there's this whole amazing creative process going on so you know it's kind of fascinating to to see where we're being rigid mm -hmm. about what our body should or shouldn't do and and can we come into harmony with what it's naturally wanting to express at this time and and where does that take us and what does that give us yeah it's like <laughs> that just it just it, it's just that it's the rule thing isn't it like the mm -hmm. rules well the rules are that we sleep like you say for a set period of time it has to be when it's dark and it has to be this and it has to be that and it's like well maybe not mm -hmm. what if that wasn't true what if you could just do what your body wanted to do like you say get up at four if that's when it's awake and go to bed at eight yeah and it's you know and I think you know there's all sorts of good reasons why we we should be asleep in the dark you know and and I certainly don't feel like I want this to be become the norm but it's 
but there's something about you know just dance with the changes yeah. and I know that there's loads of changes going on at me in me at this time so my energy isn't as settled as it normally is so okay it's a transition time it's a an initiation period in my life so how about I recognize that and be with it and take extra care of myself in this time but but let it be and let the wisdom of it be and trust it and and I wouldn't have done that you know five ten years ago no it would have been stressful no doubt that you were not sleeping properly and that you should be sleeping better and oh, yeah I, I get I can get kind of te- you know very tangled up in that yeah it's true it's the, it's how you hold it it's whether you hold it tightly and believe that or whether you can be lighter with it and just mm. Mm. yeah that's a lovely way of putting it yeah I'm conscious of the time and I don't want to keep you for too long but I so appreciated you coming and talking to us it was beautiful. it's been lovely and if people want to find out more about you about flower essences and how they might be able to work with you how can they do that yeah so there's two places they can go to there's my personal website which is rachelsingleton.com and then for the flower essences that I make those are called light bringer essences and the website for that is lightbee.co.uk thank you so much for joining me thank you it's been absolutely lovely to have this conversation and I will see you very soon yes (laughs) (laughs) bye Bye-bye.